Well, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning. It's trying to be spring out there, and uh, it's nice to see the sun shining. Welcome everybody at home who's watching on live stream as well. It's good to have you all here. Uh, we'll continue singing here, but maybe let's take a moment and greet those around you. If you're comfortable shaking hands, or I'm not saying you have to hug, but...
This next song is a nice little warm-up for those of you who are going to be at Hymn Fest, Fest this afternoon. So here we go. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed. Josh really did well on the, uh, on the pauses there. So you guys really worked on this. Good job. Um, the idea of uh, Hymn Fest that we have this afternoon that we uh, invite you back to is that it's a chance to sing a lot of the hymns that uh, were favorites for so many, for so many years. And so a lot of, a lot of great uh, depth in the words and everything. And so we invite you this afternoon, if you'd like to come and join in at 2.30 is when the prelude gets going. And they play like a half hour of all kinds of, of uh, hymns and uh, gospel music. And then it kicks into the singing portion at 3 o'clock. And uh, they have potter's clay here. Now this is, I'm told, but bands do this sometimes where they'll, you know, groups claim to retire and then they come out of retirement a bunch of times. But it turns out that they claim that this is their last, uh, one of their last performances. So definitely you want to uh, take advantage of uh, seeing them uh, as, because you won't have an opportunity again, supposedly. It feels like encores, though. Like, the bands always say, we're done, and then everyone claps really loud, and they come back again. You're like, okay, you were just tricking us. But um, that's today, and so we welcome you to come back for that. Uh, on June 12th, we have a church barbecue. Now, what we do as a church, as a congregation, is at least twice a year, we like to get everybody together and have like a little family chat time where you can, you know, hear what's going on. You can ask questions, that type of a thing. Um, we're going to be doing that on June 12th, but we don't have a whole lot of decision. We have no decisions at this point, um, this week anyway, that we need to make. Uh, so what we would like to do is just kind of have a chance to, to chat a little bit. So, so a brief meeting at the end of the service uh, just basically, hey, this is what's happening, got any questions, and then we will have a barbecue together. And we're going to have uh, 
you know, the obstacle course inflatable up. We're going to do all these different things, so it'll be a great time for family and a great time to bring people out and to just enjoy being together. This requires a group effort, though, and so we need your input. Um, the, the board, uh, were, they were saying, why doesn't everybody just bring stuff? And so if you want, if you want to donate a sleeve of burgers, could you bring them in the week before so we know how many we have? But if you want to donate something like that, or if you uh, can bring a salad the day of, that would be great. And uh, we'll just participate together um, that morning. We need people who will flip burgers, who know how to start the, the uh, grill, because it turns out, anyway. So we need people that know all these things. And then we also need people to help serve and to clean up all of that. It's a family style thing. It's a group effort. So would you let us know? either me directly or Ali in the office, and uh, we'd love to compile that list. So June 12th, everyone come on out, and let's... If the weather's bad, we'll figure it out too, right? Well, that's the nice thing about having the gym. We can put the inflatables up in there as well if we need to, but we're hoping to be outside. Um, there is a need for volunteers. Like, as we are doing more things here at the church, uh, we need people who are willing to serve as hosts who can... Uh, be ushers. We need people who can uh, be involved in praying after the services. We need people who want to uh, help, you know, get the computer going and, and talk to Jim about that. But we need people who will scroll through the music during the services. We need people who want to learn how to do live stream and can help us with that. There's lots of different ways that you can get involved. Let us know and we'd love to connect you. There are a lot of job opportunities in the uh, out there right now. And we just want to let you know, first of all, as a church, we're hiring five summer staff. Um, so anyone who's like 15 up to 30 years old can uh, get these uh, summer job grants from the government. But we have five positions here that we're uh, taking applications for. But we also want to let you know that River's Edge Camp has um, like over 20 positions that they're looking to fill for the summer. If you want to spend a, uh, you know, a fun summer getting to hang out with friends and uh, just you know, bless kids and families, uh, you need to go to River's Edge Camp website and see where you can plug in there. It would be a great opportunity to spend the you know, seven weeks full-time out at the camp and to uh, just make friends and, and some great memories out there. So we invite you to look into that. Uh, this past week, we heard news that Noreen Fisher passed away. Now, Noreen and uh, Elroy had attended our church for many years, were very involved here over the years, and, uh, and so Noreen, she had been living in Olds and, and uh, moved into the Calgary area and then just uh, passed away this week. And so, uh, so we want to let you know that there will be a funeral on, on uh, Thursday, that's June 2nd, at 1.30, and, um, and just to let you know that that'll be happening here in our church, 1.30 on, on, to, on Thursday. And so, um, yeah, Noreen was the kind of lady, through COVID, the one person that we saw come to the office was Noreen. Uh, she just wanted to get out and see some people, but it was also, she'd bring some Timbits by and just, or, you know, she'd do, have some kind of cookies or whatever, and she'd drop it here and just wanted to chat. She was just the kind of person who wanted to find out what's going on and wanted to be involved. She'd been involved with Willing Hands and lots of things over the years. And, and her husband, Elroy, wow, he was a miracle story. Um, God had really worked in his life. He was uh, struggling for a while, and, and God just moved in his life. He was, he was a man who was transformed uh, spiritually um, in his life. And um, yeah, it was just really amazing to see how God worked through their family and and I think that you'll be encouraged and, uh, and reminded of God's goodness on Thursday as well. Um, yeah, so why don't we pray for their family? You know, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take an offering. Now, if you missed last week, you will be shocked that we decided to resurrect the offering socks. And so the offering, um, the baskets are going to be passed through. And, um, and we know that the majority of you give online, which is great. So I guess as it goes by, take that as a reminder that this is a time to, uh, to remember to do that. But we appreciate the partnership that people have with the ministry here. We don't take it lightly. We understand that this, like I've said before, is a group effort. 
This is a family, and we stand together, and we've decided together as a congregation uh, things that we would be involved in, not only here in our community, but around the world. But then, once we decide that, that requires that we all get behind it and participate. And so um, that's what this is uh, as we pass the offering. Um, and if you're visiting, it's just it's great to have you here. If you choose to partner with us, awesome. Uh, if you're involved in another church, we'd love it if you would support your, uh, your church at home as well. And so let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for how you provide for our needs. We thank you for how you provide for the church's needs and how you, um, you have guide, been a guide for us over the years as we've made decisions and, and taken on projects, Lord, that you have uh, been faithful. And so we thank you so much. Thank you that you give to us and, uh, and that you invite us to, to be a part of what you're doing. And so I pray for those who are struggling today to know where they will pay their, next, their bills and uh, how you'll provide. Would you remind them of your your provision in their lives as well. Father, we pray for Noreen's family. We thank you for the testimony that Noreen was to so many and that she was an encouragement and a, and a friend to so many people. And Lord, I pray that as we gather to honor her on Thursday, that you will um, you'll use that time as an encouragement to the family, that it'll be a blessing to them, but also that those who attend would be reminded of your presence in our lives. And so we, uh, we commit that time to you. Lord, we, we continue to worship you this morning, thanking you that you are involved in, uh, in our lives in this way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I was just going to say that the more you give, the more chance we wouldn't have to bring our own hamburgers to the barbecue, right? And on another note... Sorry, Larry, you just keep playing. That's good. Um, you know how when some people pass from our midst in the church family, uh, prayer warriors, I think names that come to mind are Margaret Fradley and, and Willard Swalm and some of those people. I think when Colin was talking about Noreen's passing, and she was a very sweet and kind lady, he's looking for someone to take on the mantle of Tim Bits. He didn't say it outright, but the implication was very clear. I'm sure all of you were thinking the same thing. So, but anyhow, let's stand together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart.
more time. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart.
thank you today. We praise you that your name is holy, that the very meaning of your name of breathing, that, Lord, we breathe in, we breathe out, we breathe your name. And so, Lord, I pray that you will help us today, that we will open our eyes to, uh, to your word, that you will speak to our hearts, and that we will be able to respond well. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, worship team. That's always uh, such a powerful song. And, you know, the idea of Yahweh that's interesting is that the, the Hebrew word is actually crammed together. There's no, uh, there's no vowels in it, right? And it's, it's un- they understand that almost some have speculated that means to breathe. It's actually the sound of breath. And it's this idea that when, when God breathed life into Adam, that actually as we breathe, we are speaking the name of God, that we give him glory. It's a, it's a profound thought that uh, many have uh, tried to wrestle with the word and its meaning and all of those things. It's really cool. Um, hey, you'll notice I'm alone today. Uh, as far as pastors go, I'm, I'm with all of you. I appreciate that. But the, uh, the pastors are, they, they took off. Christine's been on holidays, getting ready for summer. Um, you know, Spencer, he's actually not on holidays. He's out with the youth uh, at River's Edge Camp this weekend. I think there's like, there's over 20 some uh, kids from here. But then also, um, you know, they got together with Bethel and Carstairs and Bonavista. Uh, brought some youth from Calgary, and so I think there's over 50 kids that are out there this weekend, and they didn't get rained on, so pretty amazing for them. Uh, it's a great, great thing. We love to see youth get together. We love to see them uh, getting out and uh, just spending time together. That's where it all happens, right? And so uh, that's awesome. Uh, and then Bruce got the, uh, got the call from, from Mountain View because it uh, turns out their pastor's sick today or this week, and so, uh, so Bruce was able to uh, dust off last week's sermon and he's heading out there to, um, to tell him about Romans 13. So um, that's awesome that we can bless other uh, churches in that way too. We've talked about that actually as staff is that, you know, that we would be willing and on call for other, other congregations around here. That's the, uh, the blessing of having multiple uh, staff members that we can help some of these churches that are, um, you know, it's harder to fill in that way. Uh, today, if you'd get your Bibles out or the ones that are in, your, in the rows ahead of you, the New Living Translation is what I'll be working through today, but carry on with whatever you have. Um, but we're in Romans 14. So one of the things that we've talked about lately is this idea that um, first part of Romans is understanding what it means to be um, accepted, what it means to be invited into God's family, how, what faith does in our lives, how it, it transforms us, how it, you know, offered, that we are offered salvation through faith in Jesus, and that this includes all of us, uh, Gentiles and Jewish people all together in the Roman church, combining as, a, as new believers uh, following after Jesus with a very eclectic group that was getting together. And so it was interesting. It's been interesting to kind of journey through this book. And now we get the last few chapters are all about the application. So we've been going into issues. Last week it was about government and uh, how we relate to those in authority. And this week we're going to talk about unity that comes um, and dealing with uh, the weaker brother as the language, and so this will be fun. Let's, uh, let's get into Romans 14, but the question I want to have as we go through this passage, to have this question going around in your mind, is this. What are you willing to give up for the sake of unity? What are we willing to give up to keep relationship with someone else? And that's been the question of the last few years, right? And, uh, and the question would be really, why should I give up something if the other person's belief is ridiculous and unfounded? It's not kind of what it goes to. Like, why should I limit my freedoms for you? Because you clearly don't know anything. You know, it's that feeling. That's a harsh way to say it. But let's, uh, so Romans 14, verse 1. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. So, accept those who are weak in faith. Have you ever wondered what Paul's talking about here? He's talking about 
the weaker brother is what the NIV talks about, but those who are weak in their faith. And there's different views of what the weaker brother might be. Um, is it about new Christians, those who are fragile in their faith because they're just new and you don't want to cause them to have trouble? So is it about them? Or is the weaker brother talking about somebody who's been a Christian their whole life, 80-some years that they've been a Christian, but they're so legalistic and structured in their view of faith that they're, in a sense, their faith is weak? Which way does it go? The, um, the African Bible commentary says, those who are weak in faith felt that they must do some things and abstain from others to stay close to God. So it's about striving for moral purity that's seen in our behaviors. That's what, um, what many have understood the weaker brother to mean. It's the one who actually, their view of faith is quite thin and doesn't understand all that they have in Christ. So with that, let's move through the chapter. Verse 2. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. So who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they, are, they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. You know, we're to live in unity without judging others. So can you imagine the church in Rome that Paul is writing to? Can you imagine how crazy it must have been to try to pastor this group of people? Because you have people who have been Jewish. Uh, they've, they're, they come of a, you know, Judaism. They follow, you know, the laws and all of this. And then they come in contact with Jesus, the Messiah. Their lives are transformed. Now what do they give up? What do they have to still do? Does the law have any place in their life, these legalistic things? Or do they just live free and everything's fine? They're wrestling with that. Meanwhile, you have new believers, new Christians who are coming from very, <clears throat> very diverse cultures, that they would come from uh, places that would worship idols and different things like that. So now, how do you bring this in? Kind of reminds me of a um, <clears throat> uh, bowling night I had in Salmon Arm, and uh, we ended up bowling to ABBA. It was glow-in-the-dark bowling, and we were trying to be all like 80s or something, and we were 70s, whatever ABBA was. Anyway, um, you'll notice that we don't have, well, we do have ABBA singing nights, don't we? Not in church. But the, uh, the thing was, we're bowling, and this guy comes in, and he's horrified that his daughter is at this event where ABBA's playing. He's just traumatized because he was a new Christian in his life, had come out of kind of a party past, and for whatever reason, us bowling that day with glow-in-the-dark bowling with Abba was a trigger for him. <clears throat> and he proceeded to tell me about that trigger. But um, it was just an interesting thing because it seemed very innocent to the rest of us. But to him, all of a sudden, it was like this thing that set him off. That's the kind of thing that Paul is dealing with in his church, not Abba. But he's dealing with the whole problem in Rome where you try and bring different um, cultures together. And so Paul warns them that they could easily start to judge one another <clears throat> and maybe even condemn others for their beliefs and their behaviors. You know, one person decides to bring a roast to the church potluck and uh, in Rome there, brings this roast and thinks that this is a great, you know, offer that you would bring this roast to the, to the party. Everyone should be thanking them. But what happens instead is that somebody goes, where did you buy that? Did you buy that in the market? Because you know that that food has been sacrificed to an idol and yet you bring that into our holy gathering? Like, how dare you? And they get all offended and there's this, this you know, pot roast size wedge that's driven into this relationship, right? And so it was this kind of thing that they had to navigate all these different backgrounds, all these different perspectives. All these different podcasts would all get together and sit in the same room <clears throat> and have different views on things, and they would now 
you know, come together as one church family. I'm, I'm hoping that's coffee, Del. Ah, oh. well, I'll take it. I'll take a cup of water in Jesus' name. It's all good. <clears throat> Sorry, I thought I was good. Thank you very much. So they have all these people in the same room, but quickly both sides start to judge and condemn the other one, right? The issue, though, was that they were usurping the role of God in, in each other's lives. That it was actually God was accepting them, Paul says, but they were, um, but he reminds them that it's important that, first of all, if it's important to God, if it's important enough to God that they should give up something or they shouldn't do this other thing, then we need to trust that God, by his Holy Spirit that's resident in their lives, will convict them of that thing. And so we aren't the convictors. It's the Holy Spirit working in our lives that is the one who makes this determination. And we'll get further into this as we go. But verse uh, 5. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. And those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. Which is interesting, right? I, I have a bad habit. Sometimes I just get eaten because you know, I'm getting on with the, uh, the meal and I forget to thank God for that food. But what's interesting is when you do that, you're honoring God for taking care of you. And you're, you're thanking him for the blessing that we have, his provision. And, uh, and so... As they would do this, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living and of the dead. Did any of you, um, I know you did, <clears throat> so I'm just uh, going to say it. It's a rhetorical question. Um, did any of you, do you remember the era of uh, no sports on Sunday? How, how many of you grew up in that kind of a house? Now, I've heard different variations of that one where some, they weren't allowed to even go outside. It was like, you lock down, this is pre-internet days, right? And so there's no Wi-Fi and you're stuck in the house staring at the wall enjoying the Lord's Day. Like, it was hard for some people, right? And there's different variations. I grew up in a community in southern Alberta where we had a large uh, Dutch Reformed kind of a community. <clears throat> they were hard and fast on that rule. And we had some really good hockey players on our team that were not allowed to play on Sundays, so they did have some sway, but it was a whole different time period back then. Some, some people are wishing for those days again, I know, but it's this idea that there was a day that everything just shut down in our community. Now, the strange thing for me, growing up in the church that I did, which wasn't an evangelical missionary church, by the way, but the church that I grew up in, while, they were, while, while my friends weren't allowed to go and play hockey on Sunday, when we did go to the games, their parents would go out for smoke breaks in, the, in between periods. And the church I grew up in, that was like taboo, right? And so how is it that they were able to go out and smoke, have a beer, and yet, you know, like they couldn't play on Sunday, right? So what is that about? Well, that was the place I grew up in. Wouldn't have been anything like Didsbury. Um, but we had different views on so many things, and it was crazy. But you know what I started to realize as I got a little older and, and uh, got a little further away from the town I grew up in? I realized that a lot of what we do is we start to judge one another, and the irony is that both sides look at each other as the weaker brother. It's a crazy thing that uh, both, of, both sides look at each other with suspicion, feeling that the other side is weak in their faith. 
But isn't it all a matter of perspective then? In that context, it was about perspective. And I think if we were honest, we had realized that it was about culture that brought our convictions more than it was sometimes the Bible. So it's important that we don't try to spiritualize, you know, personal preferences or culture and make it somehow a faith issue. Weird example, but <clears throat> I, was, I was pastoring in a salmon arm and the three of us as pastors had somebody sit us down and dress us down with a whole thing about how classical music is the only spiritual music that should be allowed. Because classical music is the only godly type of music. It was interesting because if you look back at some of where some of those songs came from, but anyway, we won't get into that. The, the thing is, though, that there's some, in my family anyway, that would say that Gaither music is the only music that's spiritual. And, uh, like, it, it, uh, it has strong foundations that go deep into very old soil. But the thing is, the, uh, I'm just kidding. No, I really hope I'm kidding. I grew up on Petra. Petra was very spiritual because in the cassette jacket, they would actually put the verses that the song came from. So that was spiritual. You could back it up with scripture. It was good stuff. Others are Wren Collective, I guess, now, right? So whatever it might be, you come from a different culture, different time period, you start to think, well, that's how it should be, right? So all of our convictions are based on uh, things that actually might just be a bit of culture more than Scripture. Greg and Shelley's church in Mexico, whenever you go to visit Greg and Shelley, they will do a little survey and see if you have nose piercings or any kind of odd piercings. If you have tattoos, you need to cover them up, right? So I had to wear a turtleneck the whole time. It was awful. Um, all the tattoos that are on my body. Greg and Shelley, their church feels very strongly about piercings and tattoos. They are, um, it's, it's that kind of a, a place. And they would say, well, there's reasons for this because there's gang activity in their area and some of these things relate to that. Um, when you go to a Romanian church, you go to Romania and there's differences in churches there. Some of the churches, women need to wear head coverings. It's kind of expected that you would cover your head. And yet, you know, it's just a different culture, a different place. And they would have verses, by the way, to back up some of these things. Um, of course, tattoos, you read about that in Revelation, that he had it written on his thigh. Um, anyway... <laughs> We won't get into tattooing. Let's move on. The Roman church um, would have had a variety of backgrounds with different traditions, right? So the Jewish believers would have assumed that Saturday was the holy day. After all, Moses was given this by God as one of the commandments, right? And yet they, uh, now the Gentiles, the new believers, the new, the new Jesus movement, decided to worship on Sunday as the first day of the week. That was the day that Jesus was resurrected after all. So why wouldn't you w use worship on that day? So now they're talking about holy days. So you have one group that's, that has had it entrenched culturally and spiritually for, for their whole life that Saturday is the day. Suddenly they come in and say, well, actually it's Sunday. And they're going, well, where did you come up with that day? I take Mondays off personally. So that's my Sabbath, right? So where do we all these things fit in together? <clears throat> so the early church was wrestling with all these issues in a relatively short time. When you think about how quickly some of these changes, how rapidly this happened in the early church, we're, we're talking just a few decades and all of a sudden they were dealing with the ten, one of the Ten Commandments, that that wasn't you know, a requirement anymore in that way. They were dealing with, they didn't even talk about in this passage about circumcision. But, you know, you think about how that was given to Abraham. So why is this not brought up as one of the big issues? But in Acts 15, we saw that the early church came to, you know, have to make some decisions about where they stood on those things. And that it was no longer a requirement. See, the gospel was about a change of heart rather than a cultural separation. So this change of heart was not about being culturally separate. 
It was about being morally distinct, that, that there was a different set of values and morals that we would live out. The way that we would treat one another was more important than the day that we would take off. So to follow Jesus means to die to ourselves. We pick up our cross, we follow after him, and we're to have the same attitude as Jesus did when he gave up his rights and offered himself as a servant on the cross for our sake. And we're to have the same attitude as Jesus. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. We live to honor God first and foremost. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which is a similar type of a passage, if you want to spend time on that uh, to follow up. But he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I don't know if you're like me, but I spent a lot of my life worrying about what other people thought was right and wrong and not so much about what God thought. Because uh, there's this incredible freedom that we have in Jesus, right? That he frees us, his Holy Spirit fills us and directs us, guides us into truth, all of this. And yet we worry about what other people might think. So this idea of trying to earn favor with God um, by how we behaved was now no longer, we, we got that that actually won't earn his love. That he loves us because he gave his son for us and that he fills us with his Holy Spirit. He's lavished his love on us in that way. But we struggle with judging others, right? Based on our own convictions. Or we might condemn someone else because they are starting to limit my freedom and they're they're kind of being a boat anchor for me and it's frustrating, right? It's dragging me down. Just let me be free and live my life. So to live in unity means not judging one another. But let's go on to verse 10. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me. And every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. So the idea here is that we need to live in unity without offending one another. And that's where it gets tricky. Because it's one thing to not judge or condemn but now I have to live in such a way that I'm not offending people? Doesn't that sound really like a heavy weight to bear? Well, verse 14 says, I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person, it's wrong. There were people around this time Jewish uh, people who would die because they refused to eat pork in the in this region it was like it became this distinction that was there and so they had some deep-seated like convictions that had actually cost them dearly if another believer is distressed by what you eat you're not acting in love if you eat it don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died then you will not be criticized for doing something that you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. So our aim is not to please ourselves. And remember that Jesus calls us to die to ourselves, right? And to love our neighbors. So if someone has a weak conscience or a thin understanding of what it means to trust in Jesus, they can get offended by our freedom, right? So here's three things that we need to pursue. First of all, and this is more important than food or drink, believe it or not, um, The first thing is that we need to live a life of goodness. Some other versions talk about live a life of righteousness, right living, virtue. Um, it's, It's this purity that is in our lives. The second thing is to live a life of peace. 
peace of mind that's not divided. And I've had so many days, things growing up where I was trying to please, you know, different people around me, trying to live like perfectly because it felt like there's people that were always watching us. And, uh, and so then I had a fractured peace in my mind. It was like divided. I was always wrestling with things and I was tormented by different, you know, what, is this okay? I don't know. But if you pursue a peace of mind, there's, there's just this calmness that goes, I'm accepted by God. I don't have to worry about, you know, my mom's friend who always called her and told her what I was doing wrong. Um, you know, like it was just simply just be, right? Peace of mind, but also peace with those who are, we're in relationship with. The third thing is to live a life of joy. And this celebrates the acceptance that we have in Jesus and the acceptance that we can offer one another. That it's not mine to carry. I don't need to, you know, live someone else's life. That it, God is just, uh, he's working in my own life and he is my judge. So we aim for harmony in the church for unity brings glory to God while disunity dishonors God. It's not sad and we've seen this throughout history within churches, right? Where there's disunity, it brings dishonor to God and to the rest of us, right? We feel the pain of other fractures, even in our own community right now. We feel the pain of what's happening in other places because we're all one family. Those of us who are following Jesus together in this region, we are a part of a family together. And so disunity is hard for all of us. It impacts us as well. So we risk tearing apart the living temple that God put together that you read about in Ephesians 2, that we've all been placed as a living temple. Each of us have been put in this place. So why would we go around trying to tear it down and to cause fractures? Verse 20, don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it's wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. Doesn't this feel like one of the most Canadian passages ever? It's kind of like, you do you, just keep it to yourself. As long as no one's hurting anyone else, it's all good, right? Like, like it's just this kind of like, we'll be all right. And so how do we live this out? What do we do? You know, just, uh, just let people be free, make their own decisions as long as it's not bringing harm to anyone else is kind of the Canadian way. But there's, there's some truth in the fact that but the goal is always to help others and not to hinder them in their walk with God. And that's, that's the bigger issue here. If I dig in and I want to, you know, like have a certain practice in my life, but it comes at the cost of someone else struggling in their, in their own walk, what good is it? Like I've become selfish, self-centered, and, and Paul in another passage says he would just rather not ever eat any of that again, right, if it would cause someone to stumble. But this requires discernment, and this is where it's been hard for me growing up in a very conservative, evangelical world. It's been hard to know when it's okay and when it's not. And so, um, so I grew up in a time when Christians, they tried to define everything. The length of your hair, the color of your, the denim that you wore, um, blue was evil, the, the music we listened to, the, uh, the alcohol content of our drinks, it was all included and decided by others what your convictions should be. And so I did crack on that one for a reason. Um, we decided what our conviction should be in each area it was kind of imposed upon us, right? In fact, to the point where there could be excommunication in some congregations, right? If you, if you did certain things, you could be, 
you know, ostracized and put out, which is so hard to know, like, who's the judge here? Isn't God the one that calls us and works in our life? So a lot of what was determined by others and life for me was defined by others and could simply be kind of encircled with the word don't. It, that was kind of how it came down. Like, like basically, don't. It, it, it's kind of like when I go to insurance companies to ask about something we can do at the church, and they say, don't. That's, that's kind of how it goes. It's always first, first thing you're saying, but what about don't? You know, and that was the life that I grew up in. That's my baggage. This is my counseling session. But as many of my peers grew up, we started to read the Bible, which is interesting, we started to read more in the Bible. We started to look into this deeper and we realized that what was handed to us, ready for it, was a culture, not a faith. Um, I think I already got paid for this month, so I, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> but let's be honest, everyone. We have been passing down a culture oftentimes and not a faith in Jesus. And if you don't fit, if you don't know the culture, if you don't know the Gaither song, you feel like you're out of it, you don't belong, right? That's a culture. That's not your Christian faith, your Christ-centered faith. And so we began to question and push back. It's gone even more so with younger generations, right, where they're going, you can't, you can't back up a bunch of what, what you've been trying to sell here. It's not actually adding up. So there, something's wrong here. And we've had to take an honest look at what is it in our faith that's actually cultural more than faith-based. And that's been unsettling for many people. Maybe you're feeling unsettled as I'm even talking right now. It's kind of like, well, what, what is a standard? It used to be very clear. We could just, we knew what was in, we knew what was appropriate, and we knew what was not appropriate, and you'd just stay away from that and condemn anyone who did, Right? Well, discernment is so much harder. And yet it is the way that we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be wise. We're supposed to be living in a way that has wisdom and says there are times that are okay and there are times when it's not okay. And you have to seek God. You have to, to discern when it's okay. Discernment is so much harder. And there's times when certain foods or drinks or activities are okay. No big deal. But then there are times, other times, when it isn't wise because it might hurt someone else or it may cause someone to struggle in their own faith. So somebody tells you they're an alcoholic, they're trying to stay dry, why would you offer them a beer is kind of the, you know, if we want to get real about that. Having said that, there's been times where I've turned down hospitality that's being offered to me, not because of the person that's right in front of me, but it's about the lady who would call my mom and tell her about what I was doing. And I would hear about this, this uh, did I already say that she was Mennonite? Anyway, the, uh, the, this lady who was, I grew up in this kind of a world, right, where we had very strong values. Now, I don't know, maybe my mom was calling her about her son, too. I'm not sure. Mom will tell me after she watches this at the lodge today. But the, um, the thing is that, that it, they wanted so much for us to be safe in our values. They wanted so much for us to be growing in our faith and to be getting closer to God. And so they knew the dangers that were out there, and so they tried to put parameters around us, and they... And so, then as a youth pastor, I was trying to do the same thing with youth groups and, and try to, to put guards around them so they wouldn't get into trouble because he knew so many people could get themselves into trouble. But did we sell them something that wasn't actually discerning, that was simply an easier way of just like, you know what, it's easier if you just don't. But what have we done? I met a lady, I don't know if I've told you this already, but when I went to Bonavista, I met a lady that grew up in my town of 1,200 people. There were two schools. There was a Catholic school, public school, and then later on another, a Christian school that opened up. And so in this little town, 1,200 people, this, this other lady that I met that I've become good friends with in Calgary, 
she, um, she grew up in the same town. We actually worked in the same hospital for a little while when I was in high school. I was a care worker, and she was also working there. We cannot remember each other for the life of each other. Like, we cannot just... She was only two years older than I was. Problem was, she went to the Catholic school. She was Catholic, and so I didn't in our very proper ways in our church, we didn't associate back then together. And there were very strict rules that were put in place. And I regret now, looking back at it, what was I about? Why was I so caught up in, you know, worrying that I'd somehow be defiled by somebody who was outside of my church walls? And so I turned down hospitality with my friends in high school I turned down hospitality after the fact. I was just going to live a very upright, pious life. I would struggle with my arrogance, my pride. I would condemn others. I would judge others. I tell you my story because I know it's many of our stories, right? This is something that we've all, like if if you've grown up in an evangelical kind of world, and you are, say, over the age of, I don't know, 35, 40, you have had to wrestle with these kinds of things. But discernment is so hard. We're free to eat or drink, but we have to be sensitive to those who we are with in the room in front of us. You have to be wise in how you interact. But that doesn't always mean turning something down because it could be that we're drawing unnecessary barriers in our lives. And we can talk about that. You can set up a meeting with me. Uh, I'll be gone on holidays soon, but um, you can set that up. This has been a long journey, and the reason I'm kind of going on about this is that, um, that it has been a spiritual, philosophical reasoning thing that I've had to study Scripture come to terms with in my life because there are some convictions in my life that were, that were handed to me by a community, a faith community. It wasn't just my own family. It was a faith community that actually set us apart and divided us from the very world that we're trying to reach. I think there are unnecessary barriers. Verse 22, you may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, um, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. I didn't even, like, it's only now that I'll say this word, yoga, yoga, Right? That's one of the ones that a lot of Christians these days, like I hear people going, well, isn't it about worshiping, you know, the the different poses are about idols and and different gods. Other people are like, it stretches. It stretches people, right? And so you've got these two. So you would have to be discerning. The same principles apply as you go through these kinds of things. I open my Bible. Um, So... We've all experienced peer pressure in both directions, right? To abstain and to partake. We've all experienced the peer pressure of trying to be like um, that we somehow need to be judgmental on this thing, that this is a problem. We should all believe this. And then there's others, other times where we've felt this, this stretch of compromise, where we've done some things that go against our own personal convictions, but we've compromised and given in. Of course, we know that there are times when peer pressure has caused some to compromise, that they have uh, been weak in terms of their standard, their, their ability to stand strong on, on decisions that they've made. And so we never want to be the one that's caused that problem. Our aim in all things is to seek harmony, to pursue peace, and to try to build each other up and not tear down. So when do we question someone else then, is just as I conclude, when do we question someone else's choices or decisions? First of all, if they've been very clear about their convictions and their standards and they're living outside of that, I'd say that there's an accountability piece there, right? It's pretty obvious that they're 
they're contravening something that they've said. And you just want, it's not like you're going, hey, you said you would never. It's more like, I'm curious. Like, I thought that this was your standard. Why, why are you okay with this now today? And they might have a very good answer. If their decision is hurting somebody else and you know it, that it's, it's dragging somebody else down, then gently you would want to uh, chat with that person and say, hey, did you know that this is a consequence of what you're doing or this is what's happening as a result of what you've done or said or all of those things. But you do it gently. You do it wisely. There's an appropriate time. Ultimately, we are not the judge of other people, right? That uh, they answer to God themselves. So we need to be humble as well. When somebody questions something that we might be doing or saying or whatever, if they've done it correctly and gently, um, we should also take a moment to pause and go, hmm, I wonder if I am compromising or I wonder if I am being too strict on this issue. Maybe there's some room for this. And, uh, and so you take some time to learn from one another to go, is this the Holy Spirit speaking to me through this person? Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they've decided is right. But most of all, this comes out of a relationship with God himself. So what are you willing to give up for the sake of unity? Is it your, your um, protected bubble? Is it your kind of safe space? Or is it something that you're doing that you need to potentially give up or change? That's a question. Are we willing to do this for the sake of others? That's what Paul was pushing these people on. And uh, it's something that has not changed. The issues might have changed. Food, we don't really think a lot about. Well, I'm thinking about food a lot right now, but the, we don't really think about what we eat or you know, what we, uh, you know, whether it was sacrificed to idols, for example. Although, if you go into some restaurants, you'll see that there's a shrine you know, as you go into the restaurant, and somehow we've been able to walk past that and go, oh, it's just it's not anything. That might be offensive to some people in other cultures, right? So let's uh, walk with humility and grace as we go through this. And so when I say grace, I mean towards me. Okay, <laughs> we should pray. <laughs> oh, Lord, we need you to give us wisdom and discernment because it feels like a minefield sometimes, um, trying to honor you but also to honor those that we're in relationship with. Would we be welcoming people? Would we be those who are willing to host and to be hosted? Lord, that we would not um, put up unnecessary boundaries that, uh, that just draw wedges between us and the relationships with others. Uh, help us to be clear on what our culture is and what our faith is and to see the differences. I pray that you will shape us, that we'll be more Christ-like in the way that we act and that your Holy Spirit would fill us and give us wisdom. And we thank you for how you work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's a tough topic Colin got to share with us. And it's, I'm so thankful that we have the Lord in our lives because it's not possible to do what he said or shared without the Lord's guidance and strength and his love flowing through us. There's just, I mean, judgment, that's a human nature. We judge people at a glance, right? So thanks, Colin. Let's all stand. We have a wonderful way maker. That's my segue. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are way Here it is. 
the next chapter, Romans 15, 5, talks about how, well, Paul has this, this statement, and it'll be the benediction. So may God give you a spirit of unity among yourselves so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we go today with the sense of harmony and unity that we are all to called together to be his body in this place. May God bless you as you go into the community this coming week as you live your lives that he will